we're going to, I want to just kind of strip away all of everything you think about the word race and kind of redefine it. And so I want to start by talking about the biological application of race. And some of my biology students in here may disagree with the way I phrase this, but I'm going to phrase it a specific way for a specific purpose. And that is that a race is a genetically related um, population of any animal that is geographically separated from other members of the same species, but that because of environmental and climate factors has evolved slightly differently. That, I, that geographic isolation means that those genes that are favored in one geographic area are likely to be more successful and in another area with different climate or different geographic uh, issues, it is likely that those same, that same combination may not be the most successful. A different combination may, that then again of course accounts for what we today believe to be separate races. Do not conflate the terms ethnicity and race. They do not mean the same thing. And ethnicity is a culture or a subculture. It has nothing to do with race. You can be black, brown, yellow, green, or purple. It doesn't matter. Race, as we currently define it, is based on five phenotypical markers. Anybody know what they are? What's the first thing we base race on? Of what? Skin color. What's the next one? Hmm? Hair. 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 What? Hair color and texture. Okay, we got that. What else do we use? I'm sorry, what? Eyes. Is that what you said? Yeah, both eye shape and eye color. Right? So those are the five things. That's it. Think of all of the things that make you you. And those five things are the things that in the modern world we used to say, oh, you're this, you're that, you're something else. Completely stupid and superficial. Early on, back in the early 18th century, uh, it, was referred, there were, there, it was believed to be three great races. The white, the black, and the yellow. In other words, Eurasia, Afro-Eurasia, right? Because there is contact from, say, about 3000 BC to the present of peoples from Africa, Europe, and Asia. Because they really are all, they're connected. They're one continent. We claim that it's three, but where does, the, where does Asia begin and Europe start? There's, it's the middle of a landmass, right? If you use the geography that's there, like the Urals, the Ural Mountains, that runs right through countries. So, you know, our country, some, is Russia in Asia or Europe? The answer is yes, right? If we're going to do it that way, because it's, it's technically in both. Moscow's in Asia and Petrograd, or, or whatever it's called today, St. Petersburg, it's back to that, uh, is, in, is in Europe and is a very European city and very European culturally, which Moscow isn't. And so those three colors really are the result of European colonialism those three designations, because they represent what the white people were doing in Europe and in Asia. The whites were basically colonizing people that were black and people that were yellow. And so there, they created the concept of race along these lines to justify colonialism. Now, let, I want to go back and talk about the historical use of the word race. If you read documents from the 17th and 18th century, you will hear people talk about the German or the Italian races. Well, neither Germany nor Italy were even countries at that time. They were both language groups. They were a geographical area, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a nation. It wasn't a state. There was no one Germany. There were hundreds of little German principalities. The same in Italy. There were hundreds of little Italies. Not the ones that are in American cities, but the ones that were in Italy, right? And... you will read about people talking about the German race. It's not even a country. 
It's just a language group, or the Italian race. You'll also read about the French race. And you go, oh, well, there's just people that speak French. No, because prior to the 20th century, people in France spoke up to 80 different languages. It was a completely disunified as far as language, and the reason why the French are so stuck up about French today, you have to pronounce it properly and use exactly the right tense and all that stuff, is because they had to superimpose a single language on the, the nation of France to try to create a unified body politic. But th that's not even, I mean, there's no phenotypical markers separating the Germans and the French and the Italians. Italians might be a little darker because they live in a warmer climate and they get a little better tan. But that's about it, right? Or you read in the 15th century. You read about, you read uh, Machiavelli, you read The Prince. And he talks about members of the Genoan race or the Athenian race. In other words, people from the city of Genoa or the people from the city of Athens. The term race in the past was only, was just simply a group. Jews today and for 6,000 years have considered themselves to be racially separate from all other groups. Whether you're a black Jew or a Mexican Jew or a Chinese Jew, your racial category is Jewish. At least in your own mind, because you racially are Jewish. Right? So, race is a constructed concept. And it is constructed by those that can make the most use of it. As I've said, genetic traits are based on natural selection. You've probably heard that our old friend Charles Darwin rode a beagle across the ocean. The beagle was a ship, not a dog. And came back and said, survival of the fittest. <coughs> He never used those words. He never once said survival of the fittest. In the original editions of <coughs> The Origin of the Species, he uses natural selection. And that's how evolution works. It is not survival of the fittest. It is selection based on the environment. Genetic traits generally are grouped together because those are the traits that allow you to survive long enough for one crucial thing. What is the one thing that has to happen for your genes to get passed down? Yeah, you've got to live long enough, become old enough and attractive enough to get laid. If you don't, your gene pool just dried up. And your traits won't get passed down. So if you have traits that are not conducive to the environment in which you live, you may not live to adulthood. And your genes won't get passed down. Or even if you do live to adulthood, yeah, maybe not that attractive, right? You just might not, you know, you're not that smart, you're not that good looking, you got a limp or whatever, and people don't like that for whatever reasons, or maybe they fetish, I don't know, whatever. But anyway, for whatever reason, you don't get laid, you don't pass your genes on, you die out. That's natural selection. And we'll talk about some of the examples as we go on here. So let's just start with the notion that race, whether we're talking in the 15th century or we're talking in the 17th century or the 18th century or the 21st century, race is a social construct. It is made up to separate me from you. That's the whole purpose. It's just to identify different groups of people. And for much of the time, regardless of where you were, your race was superior to all others. So natural selection is that process that allows you to pass on your genes. Skin color has a lot to do with how much sun is available. There are two components in your skin and your eyes, in fact, you know, all of your, your fleshy parts, that determine skin color and eye color. Those are melanin, which is the predominant one, and creatine, which is more important in the eyes than in the skin, but it also exists in the skin. And it is melanin that determines the color of your eyes and the color of your skin. If you have fair skin and you live 
in an equatorial or a tropical zone and you don't have SPF 15 sun guard, what is likely to happen if you spend an hour in the sun? You're going to burn. What happens if you burn a bunch of times? You get cancer, you get melanoma, one of the deadliest forms of cancer. My stepfather was Swede, his second, first generation, second generation, his father was from Sweden, he, he, was from, he was born here. And from the time he was like 15 years old until he died in his, in his mid-60s, uh, every year he'd have to go in and get more melanoma chopped off because he just, he'd spent lots of time, his dad owned a small vineyard and then they, uh, he worked the fields and he always got burnt and he always, you know, the skin cancer always came back. It wasn't what killed him, he had a heart attack, lucky guy. So if you have light skin and you live in a tropical zone, you're going to probably not live long enough to reproduce because you're going to die of cancer as a child. And in that community, people with light skin, people know they tend to get cancer and die. They know they get, they get the growth. They don't, may not, not know what it is. And so people don't seek out blonde-haired, blue-eyed, light-skinned people in the tropics, or didn't in the past. They might now. They might they think it's cool. But in the past, they didn't because they knew that they were likely to, if those, if those traits were passed down, their children would die. Conversely, if you have dark skin and you live in a far northern clime where there's a lot less sunlight, you are prone to vitamin D deficiencies because dark skin absorbs less sunlight than light skin. I know we always, you know, dark absorbs and what light reflects. That's not the case with skin. Light skin absorbs more sunlight. And what's one of the things you get from the sun? Hmm? Vitamin D, very good. A couple of people in stereo here. Yes, vitamin D. And what happens if you don't get vitamin D? What kind of sick? Do you, do you know? Psychologically, you can get depressed. That's, that's true. But, you, but that's not the vitamin D. That's the ultraviolet. You can get rickets. Rickets are a deadly disease that people get when they don't get enough vitamin D. That's why your milk, it, it, your, your homogenized pasteurized milk, it'll say it, that it's fortified. It's because it's got vitamin D in it. Just a simple thing of adding that one little vitamin to milk has prevented all of you towheads out there from dying of skin cancer. I mean, of, I'm sorry, from dying of rickets. I'm sorry, all of the darker skin people from dying from rickets if they live in the north, right? And so, if you, and I'll show you a map prior to 1600, right? Because 1492 is really when the two halves of the world come crashing into each other. Columbus is unimportant. The two things that are important is one, the Reconquista is completed in 1492 prior to him taking off, and that's one of the very first nation states. England is the other one. France will follow a few years later. So it's the creation of modern nation states that you would recognize as a country. The other thing is, is that this is what we call the Columbian Exchange. It is the crash of the two worlds into each other. What did the Italians eat? They got pasta from China. They got tomatoes and peppers from Central America. I mean, what the fuck? How do you make spaghetti and pizza without the shit you get from elsewhere, right? I and mean, I was wondering, what did they, they ate bread, they ate cheese, and they ate olives. They had a nice day. Uh, that's about it, right? And they had other stuff too, but they didn't have all the good stuff. It came from here. But it also is the first time that people begin exchanging. Because we'd had, for, prior to, to 1492, probably for 1,500, 2,000 years, there had been the Silk Roads, where goods and, were traded from as far away as from Cordoba, Spain, all the way over across northern Africa, across southern uh, Europe, all the way into the Middle East, and from the Middle East all the way to China. But no Chinese person ever went from China to Cordoba, and no Spaniard ever went to China. One Italian went, Marco Polo. It wasn't one, he had a you know, whole group with him, but he was the guy in charge of that group. That's the only time prior to 1492 that a Westerner made it to the East. So today, we're all jumbled up, right? People that shouldn't be living in hot climates, like all of the, the you know, like, we've got a ginger over here, he's going to, do you, do you burn a lot in this valley? 
So yeah, it, 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 oh, it was the red beard. I had the red beard too, with with, with dark brown, dark blonde hair. Yeah, so we might be related. And you know how we got that red hair, right? I told you, I think, didn't I? If you have red hair and freckles, somewhere in your ancestry are Neanderthals. They just in the last six months have identified another hominid uh, that uh, other groups are, are related to that we also interbred with uh, in West Africa before the, the migration out. So there's lots and lots of, of cross species my, uh, uh, humping going on. And this essentially prior to 1600 is the color of the skin on the people that live in those areas. And you can see that from the tropics south, it's pretty dark. From the tropics north, it's but it's not a new phenomenon. We've been struggling with this for ever. We've used national identity, tribal identity, religious identity, gender, all of these things to divide people. And much of it, it was before we had any understanding of how biology actually worked. I like to use this as a 15th century or 16th century painting, I'm sorry, uh, from uh, shortly after conquest and uh, the Brit this is from the British colonies. And at the title of the painting is called Europe, supported by Africa and America. And that kind of sums up pretty much from the Columbian experiment to the, to the present day. This is when race becomes important because once we, when we're in separate pockets on the planet, race isn't an issue. People fight over other things, their city-state, or fight for land, or fight for king, or fight for glory. They don't fight about skin color. They don't fight about race. They fight about other things, right? All of a sudden, we get jumbled together, and race becomes an issue, especially because there's a group that wants to control the rest. So as we talked about, skin color comes from melanin, and carotene, and it is triggered by solar radiation. That's how you get a suntan. You go out, you turn brown, right? Or you burn if you don't have the, the melanin to protect it. It's a filter that provides the, the uh, it, it filters out the, the ultraviolet. So let's talk about your eyes, eye color. Another very important factor. Cheddar Man had blue eyes. Well, he was living fairly far, far north. England is pretty far north, right? Were you surprised to see the, the Cheddar Man and then see his descendant? That They do kind of look alike, but Different colors, right? I love it. I have blue eyes. Um, most northern peoples do because they need to bring in more light. You know, the land of the midnight sun means that, you know, the first day you see the sun after six months, it comes up and it's up for 20 minutes and it sets again. Well, if you're living in a world that's mostly dark, you need to make the most of every bit of light that you can. So the eye is constructed like a camera lens, not the one on your phone. That's just a little... Uh, sensor, but the old style lenses where you had, you know, some lenses here and here and you had a, a chamber. If there's a lot of light, you don't want the light to bounce around inside that chamber because it causes glare and it makes it impossible to see, right? So in sunny areas, the melanin coats the inside of the iris and it prevents reflection. So if you have brown eyes, that means your eye is full of melanin and you aren't going to be affected by the glare. But you're going to have trouble seeing. You won't see as well in lower light conditions. If you have blue eyes, which have no melanin, in fact, blue eyes have no color. They're like the sky or like water. They just reflect blue. They don't have any color of them that they're on. They're completely colorless. Green eyes are some brown flecks and some blue, right? Hazel is just another version of that, right? It's all that combination, brown on one end, blue on the other, and all the mixes in between. So if anybody ever, you ever sees anybody with purple eyes, that's because they've got contacts on, right? There's nobody that naturally has, on this planet, has naturally purple eyes. Might be on another planet. Maybe they're an alien, I don't know. Uh, next time you see somebody with purple eyes, ask them what planet they came from. So again, just like skin color, right? No rickets, no, no uh, uh, skin cancer. The colors in your eyes, the colors of your eyes, have a lot to do with the geography. And so you may not live long enough to pass those genes on.
The one thing that I will say that kind of brings that everything that I just said about eye color into question is it only happens in humans. It doesn't happen in pri other primates. It doesn't happen in other animals. The same species will have the same color eyes or the same variation of eye color. Geographically, it doesn't matter where they're from. That's true with cats, it's dogs, cows, bears, you name it. Um, they don't adapt in this same way. Now, let's go back to hunting and gathering. Let's say I'm a man. I mean, well, I, we can agree. Well, maybe. Um, I'm male, and I'm in a hunter-gatherer group. What would my normal job be? To hunt, right? And this young lady, if she's in the same band I'm in, what would her normal job be? Gathering, right? So where does my eyesight need to be good? Close or far? Far, right? If I can only see up close, I'm not going to see before the tiger eats me, right? But if I can see him on the other side of the gorge, I can start stalking him. And so having good distance vision is important for men. Inversely, remember, we were hunters and gatherers for 100 million years, right? So, you know, we've only, it's only been 500 years, a little bit more, since Columbus got to America, right? So we're talking about 500 years of mixing, 100,000 years, I mean, 100 million years of evolution prior to that. Uh, when hunting and gathering. So, women need to be able to see up close. Doesn't matter if they can see long distances. Men need to see long distances. And, and so, likewise, those genes back in our hunter-gatherer days got passed down. And so, women that can't see very well very far but can see up close are, pre are preferenced. Those that can't see up close, if you can't find the berries, if you can't find the roots, if you can't find the, the little shoots that you're trying to pick to eat for supper, you're going to starve you're not going to pass your genes on. Same if you're a hunter and the lion kills you. Your genes ain't going nowhere, right? And so, over time, we adapted for that, those jobs. Again, the 500 years that we've been jumbled hasn't been long enough for evolution to take effect. It will be another thousand years and we'll all be the same color again. Even if we don't intermingle and intermarry because we will adjust to the climates. Is that something I said? Anyway. Uh, so, nearsightedness rarely happened in Native Americans, Africans, and Australians because they had hunt over large distances. European and Central and Western Asian populations, it's there. Natural selection against nearsightedness among hunters and gatherers is, among hunters, is important. Likewise, color blindness. Statistically, if you're female, it is unlikely that you are red green color blind. If you are red green color blind, you have exterior genitals. Because why would that why would those genes be selected? Why would women not be green red color blind? What is it that hunter and gather what, what is it that the gatherers are gathering much of the time? Fruits and berries. If something isn't right, what color is it? Yeah, right, it's green. What color is it if, it's, if you're colorblind, if you're red green colorblind and it's ripe, what color is it? It's green because <laughs> you can't see red, right? And so, how do you pick the, the berries? How do you pick the apples? How do you get the grapes? How do you get, how do you differentiate between what's able to be at and what isn't? Right? And so for a hundred million years, women that were red and green colorblind didn't make it. They weren't attractive mates. They might not have even made it to adulthood because they weren't able to gather properly. At least that's how we think it happened. So, if we're going to call race, if we're going to call it on biology, then we have to say that it is uh, a different genetic composition from other similarly defined populations. Um, this is a product of 100 million years of breeding. And if each of you took 
a DNA test tomorrow, and we waited and got the results back, I think many of you would be very surprised at what we found. I'm proud to be English. My family have served and we've defended this country and have been to war for this country. I'm, I'm really patriotic about Bangladesh. Well, I am 100% I am Icelandic, yeah, definitely. This is a Kurdish wedding with my mom in the traditional Kurdish clothes. We're just proud black, so that's it. Yeah, I think we are probably the best country in the world, if I'm honest. Think about other countries and other nationalities in the world. What, are there any that you, you don't feel you you get on with well or you, you won't like particularly? Germany. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the Germans. You might think they're a little bit... Particularly India and Pakistan probably because of the whole, you know, the conflict. Because I have this side of me that's like, that hates mm. Turkish people. No, not people, but the government. But French? No. <laughs> We're just best, you know, it's just fact. I'm more important than you. I don't know you, but in my opinion, I am strong and I am, I am more important than a lot of people. How would you feel about taking a journey based on your DNA? Um, yeah, I feel very uh, intrigued. What could you possibly tell me that I don't know? So do you know how DNA works? So you get half from mum and half from dad. So 50% from each of them, and they get 50% from their parents, and back and back and back. And all those little bits of your ancestor, they filter down to make you, you. I need you to spit in this tube for me. And you spit up to the little black line. That's a lot of spit. Right, the story of you is in that tube. What's it gonna tell me? It's going to be, oh yeah, you're French, and yeah. wait, your grandparents are French, and wait. 100% Bengali. Solid Iraqi. I'm Cuban. <laughs> you going to tell me that I'm English, like I've told you. Jay, can you come down and join us? I'm a little bit nervous, I have to say. So you ready to find out your results? Will you read it out to us, please? Wow, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wow. Shit, I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Caucasus, which was uh, Turkish? Yeah. <laughs> Eastern Europe, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece. I'm 32% British. <laughs> <laughs> what? Great Britain, 30%. Can we 5% German? <laughs> I'm Irish. Yeah. So I'm a Muslim Jew. Great Britain, 11%. Are you sure these results are mine? Eastern Europe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Iceland has definitely moved closer to Europe now. I'm going to go a bit far right now, but this should be compulsory. There would be no such thing as like extremism in the world if people knew their heritage like that. Like, who would be stupid enough to think of such thing as like a pure race? In a way, we're all kind of cousins, in a broad sense. Mm. In a much more direct sense. You have a cousin in this room. Mm -mm. Turn around and guess who it is. <laughs> Wash? Yeah. What's that? Why don't you come down here and oh meet your cousin? God. <laughs> I did no idea. This is like I, my heart's pounding right now. I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
and Jay from everywhere, but I wish to this. <laughs> I'm a real man of the world. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. So would you like to travel to all of these places? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs>